two uh, connected questions that I'm going to ask. One is in the reference to the June 4th raid in Harlem. The question is, how do we as a community approach the NYPD and our city officials to demand justice and free our children now, who are now incarcerated? That's right. They're now incarcerated, all facing conspiracy charges and life in prison. We need help. And then, um, which is a very powerful question. The second is, is uh, I think, related from someone in Ferguson, Missouri, from Ferguson, mm, Missouri. Right on. And they asked, why are we in 2015 still going through this hell? Because I never thought I'd be still fighting for justice. So those two questions. Yeah, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. Wonderful question. As I said before, though, that um, there's a sense in which the struggle for freedom is a perennial struggle because there's progress and then regress. For the last 30 years, there's been a class war against poor and working people, disproportionately targeting young folk of color. And the results of that class war has produced what we're dealing with right now. And that was regress. So we had breakthrough on the one hand, we had regress on the other. The breakthrough was one in which you ended up with the expansion of a black professional class and a black middle class and even a few black top dogs in terms of corporate America and Wall Street, you see. But at the same time, it was a devastation of the black working class and an expansion of the black poor who more and more find themselves unable to even find a role in the society in terms of jobs, in terms of status and stature. And that is, that, that is unbelievable regress. And, and we're dealing with the consequences of that regress. And so in that sense, you would think, well, my God, 2015, we thought, lo and behold, with Martin King and Fannie Lou Hamer and the others, that we would be able to have, be closer to black freedom. No, that's not the case at all. That the ruling class in America won the class war over the last 35 years. And we're responding to that triumph from above. And what is wonderful is the degree to which the young folk are willing to fight. I mean, and, and, oh, yes, I mean, Ferguson is just, I think, the beginning. Uh, we, we, we're going to see a whole new wave, a whole wave of activism among the young folk. And the beautiful thing is, is that the, the sisters, the black sisters, will play a fundamental role. Fundamental role. Yeah, Tef Poe, that's beautiful, but oh, you got Ashley Yates. Oh, yes, you got Tori Russell, but oh, you got... Sister Alexis, and on and on. It's going to be a collective, mutually gendered and trans affair, which was very different than what it was when we were coming along, because we know how deep that patriarchy was. <laughs> Isn't that the truth, Joe? Yeah, it is. Oh, Lord, indeed. That's why I appreciate your critique of patriarchy, especially for an old school brother like, like you hitting hard like that. <laughs> I'm old school, too, but I mean, you'd be well, surprised. Well, we have to keep on you, learning. You gotta, right? Exactly. We got to keep on learning. Well, I would say, I, you, you know, these yeah. questions, I think these two questions are very much related. I would say the basic answer to the question of why we still have to fight after all this time is because we're still living under the same system. And unless and until we get rid of the system, the same things are going to keep on happening, even if they happen in some different ways. Like I was thinking about Detroit, mm. the, 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 the most powerful urban rebellion in the 1960s took place in Detroit in 1967. Now, I'm not advocating anything, I'm just telling you the facts. The people rose up in Detroit, and yes, they came in and they killed a lot of them, but they rose up for, by, for five days. And after they killed them, they said, oh man, we've got a really serious problem here, and they went and started hiring thousands of black people right off the street into the auto plants of Detroit. And those were high-paying jobs. Now, people always, and again, I'm not advocating anything. I'm just telling you the truth when they always say, oh, when people rise up, it doesn't do any good. It never does anything good. All it does is harm, ruin our own communities. They came and they hired thousands of people right off the street. And then they commissioned the Kerner, Kerner Commission report. Yeah, you remember yeah. saying, oh, we've been mistreating black people. Who knew? And they started talking about how they kind of had to make all these changes. 
Absolutely. But now here's the thing. Here we are almost 50 years later. All those jobs that they hired those thousands of people into are gone. Most of the auto plants are closed down. Detroit is a basket case. I don't care they talk about how they got some kind of resolution to the bankruptcy. It's a basket case. Many people in Detroit can't even get water. Decent water, think about that. A large number of people. And that's because it's more profitable, like you were just talking about, for them to, to close down those plants and to open them in some country where they can force the people to work for much lower wages and to replace people by machines. And when they replace people by machines in this system, they don't go to them and say, oh, you, we're putting you out of a job, but clearly you need to live, so let us train you for another job. They just say, hit the street, you're gone. Because this is the nature of the system. It's a system driven by ruthless competition among capitalists, which drives them to exploit people and to throw them out of work if they can't exploit them enough to make enough profit. Absolutely. So, so what's the, what's the, what does that prove? Does it prove that it was wrong for people to rise up in Detroit? No. Does it prove that it's wrong for people to be rising up now? Does it do no good to struggle? You might as well just accept it because they'll just beat you down anyway? No. It's very important that people rise up, that they did so then, and they, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. We could be on the start of a whole new wave of struggle. But where is it going to go? Are we going to still be facing the same thing 50 years later down the road? Maybe not us, but other people yeah, who come yeah. behind us? Or can we actually get rid of the system and put in place an economic system that is geared to the needs of the people, not the profit of a few, and a political system that goes along with that economic system? So that's one question. Mm -hmm. Now, the other question, and I do think it's very much related, the police went rampaging into these housing projects. This is what they do to our youth all the time. Everybody talks about the prison pipeline from the neighborhood to prison. And this is what they are consciously doing with their mass incarceration, the new Jim Crow that you mentioned, the book by Michelle Alexander. Mm -hmm. This is what they're consciously doing. They put a jacket on these kids from the time they're not even teenagers. And then you've got a record. So now you've got a record. Next time you run into the police, they okay. run you through the system. You've got a record. You're, you're already heading toward being a felon, being convicted of a felony, and then being sent to prison. And then your whole family is affected by the fact that you're sent to prison. That's if right. you survive long enough to be sent to prison. So, you know, these raids they carry out, charging conspiracy, they're going and they're taking the, the, the social media of these youth. You know how youth are. You, you're talking about gangster proclivities, you know. <laughs> youth like, youth, they like to talk big, they like to talk bad, you know. I'm going to do this to you, I'm going to do that to you. They took all that stuff as if it were meant literally and said, this is all, you know, just talking bad on the, on the social media and acted as if this were actually concrete conspiracies that mm. they were waging to go out and kill a bunch of people and sell drugs. And, I mean, you could take almost any rap song and they do that too and convict a rapper of conspiracy to commit all kinds of crimes because that's what they often talk about in the rap. So where's your artistic freedom? Where's the freedom for these youth to express? They don't even, look, you know, I've often thought, sometimes walking down the street, and I have something in my pocket, and I've often thought, as I pull out of my pocket, if I were black, I might be dead now because I pulled something out of my pocket that could be construed to look like a gun or some kind of weapon. You don't have, if you, they've got these youth in the inner cities are under a state of siege where all the rights that we're told we have, they don't have. They don't even have the right to express themselves through social media. Yes, important, now, important, important. Uh, now, this, we cannot, we, cannot, we cannot accept this. This can't go down. And we've got to go out among not just the people who are directly to answer the question about what do we do about this. We can't just go out among the people who are directly affected by this. We have to go out broadly into society. We have to go out among all the diverse kind of people who are represented here tonight and say, you have to know about what is going on in this country of yours, in this society, where supposedly we have a demo democracy and supposedly we have rights for the people. But if you live in a certain part of town and you're a certain color,
and you're looked at by the system in a certain way, you don't have any of even those supposed rights. And we cannot allow that to go on. We've got to, it's our responsibility. That's right. It's our party's That's right. responsibility. And I'm determined that we live up to our responsibility, but it's also everybody's responsibility to go broadly. We got to go to the students. In the 60s, I was a student in the 60s on the college campus. That's how I got involved in the free speech movement and then working with the Black Panther Party and fighting against the Vietnam War. Why? Because when you get into the, when you're a student, I know a lot of them waste their time on nonsense, but at least when you're a student in college, you have the opportunity to learn about a lot of things if you want to do so and you take some initiative to do so. You have ideas that you can work with. You have the life of the mind that you can pursue if you have a mind to do it. And in the 60s, a lot of students did that. They would look at the world around them. Like I said, they saw people rising up and they said, I want to know what this is about. But, but, I want to understand but, this. But, but, but I think in the 60s, we had something else too. And this is a result of the cultural and spiritual war that went hand in hand with the class war that when we turned on the radio and heard the voice of a David Ruffin, or when we turned on the radio and heard Sheila and Wanda Hutchison of the Emotions saying, there was a tenderness and a sweetness and a kindness that is the raw stuff of any kind of movement. Right. Whereas today, you know, it's say my name, say my name, as opposed to try a little tenderness of Otis Redden. It's hard to find tenderness, sweetness, and kindness. Same is true in terms of the collectivities. You see, when we turn on the radio, who did we hear? We heard the Delphonics and the Dramatics. We heard Enchantment. You see, we heard Lakeside. We heard Ohio Players. Heaven must be like this and skin tight. We heard a tenderness and a sweetness. When they turn on the radio today with the oligarchs and plutocrats, the same ones who control recording and radio, and video and live performance. A cultural, a cult, that's, that's exactly right though, brother, I love that. It's a cultural, spiritual kind of call and tell pro. If somehow we can make sure that the precious souls of young black people, and of course by young black people, you're talking about all folk, because young people have been Afro-Americanized since Motown, <laughs> since the Funkadelic, since James Brown, so we can keep their souls so chilly. And I see this in teaching in prisons for 37 years. I can see the shift in it. To keep the soul so chilly, the conscience so coarsened, and the heart so hardened that you don't have the raw stuff for a movement. The people can't wait just to get over, to be, to manipulate and dominate or be obsessed with the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. Because <laughs> everybody just trying to get over by any means. That's Wall Street. Not one Wall Street executive went to jail given all the crimes that took place in 2008. They didn't get caught yet. But that sends the same kind of sign in the young folk. But see, but again, when you talk about black people, you got to talk about our spirits and our souls and bodies as well as the organizing and mobilizing or we'll never be able to pull it off. Yeah, well, I agree. I think that, you see what I mean? okay. Yeah, I do. I agree. <laughs> I, I think that culture is very important. I mean, if you go back to the beginnings yeah. of hip hop and you leave aside sort of silly things like rapper's delight or whatever, you know, which had a nice, yeah, that, that, had a nice, nice beat. Nice beat, nice beat. Had, nice had beat. a nice beat, but it wasn't about much. And the brother just died too, you know. Yeah. That brother just died. God bless his soul. But then you got, then you got, you know, uh, Melly Mel. And, and, Grandmaster and, Flash and, and the Fury Five. Grandmaster Fire. Flash, Melly Mel. Then you've got uh -huh. Public Enemy with yeah. Chuck D. KRS and they, and they were, they Wu Tang were, Clan. They were talking about oh, something. Oh yes. And what happened? The people who control things in the music industry and in general came in and said, "We don't want that." That's right. Ice T went from being cop killer to being a cop on TV, and they said, "This is, this, this is the way. This is the way you you want to make it. This is the way you make it. All the rest of that stuff." We're going to push that aside and not let it flourish. So, but I think what's happening now, when you talk about yeah. a new wave, oh, no, the wave when you have a new wave of struggle, it brings forward or can bring forward a new culture. And I agree with you. I mean, I grew up on those songs that had tenderness oh, yeah. and love too. You know, That's it's very rich, different. Rich, and, rich and stuff. it's not weak to love. That's I think that. that's something very important. 
That's it's, exactly right. It, it is not weak to love. It is not weak to treat other people as human beings. And we need a culture, right. that, a culture that grows together with the actual struggle and is a crucial part of the struggle that promotes the kind of values you're talking about, that promotes right. looking out for each other and being together and seeing what we have in common instead of trying to get over on each other. And I believe, I mean, let me look. Uh, I forget his, I can't call his Johannes name right. Johannes Hernandez, Johannes Hernandez. Give it up for Sister Johannes Hernandez, leader of the Mumia Abu Jamal movement along with Mark Taylor. We love you, we love you, Johannes. We love you, Johannes. Love you, though, sister. Uh, no, I'm sorry to take No, that's all right. That's, yeah. No, we got to pay respect. Yeah, but, that's true. Uh, I can't call his name, but I know there was a, a rapper recently who did, in, after the assassination of Michael Brown, did a, uh, came out with a song about that. I can't remember. There you go. Right? Now, that's just, you know, that's an example of what happens. It wasn't just. That's right. Here's the important thing, I think. It wasn't just because yet another black or brown youth was killed in cold blood. It's because people stood up and said, no, we don't that's care. Right. We're not taking this anymore. That's right. And that's what inspired a little spark of a new culture. And the more that that happens, the more that we can bring forward that culture. And I agree, we need that culture. Oh, yeah. I do agree. I may not agree we need to get it from God, but I agree that we need soul. And we need heart. I agree. I agree. I agree. I mean, the wonderful thing is that God doesn't ask for your permission. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just play, playing with you, brother. I'm just playing with you. Well, if I ever hear God asking me for my permission, I might change my view. <laughs> oh, Lord. A lot of people see some divine qualities in the love for the masses that you all have in the party. Now, you got to, you got to watch it. <laughs> Look.